Welcome to this video in which we'll go through an example of determining the system properties of the system divine, defined by the equation y of n is equal to x of negative n. Um, the properties that we'll look at are, are whether the system is memoryless, time invariant, linear, causal, and stable. So this equation defines the system in the sense that it tells me if I've got an input how to figure out what the output would be. Another way of looking at it, which we do quite often in signal processing applications, is I draw a system as a block diagram. <coughs> Excuse me, I have an input x of n, and I have an output y of n. And this equation tells me for a given value of n how to compute y of n. So in this case, the way the system works is if n is greater than 0, then the system looks back into the past to get x of minus n. So it, uh, <clears throat> you know, if n is equal to 3, then the system looks back into the past to get x of minus 3, and that will be the output at time 3. If n is less than 0, so y of negative 2, the system looks forward into the future to see x of 2, and um, outputs that as y of negative 2. Now, clearly, this is sort of a weird system. Um, most systems in real life can't look into the future to determine what something is going to be. Uh, especially, well, well uh, this is true if you think of n as a time variable. Sometimes you'll deal with systems that work in a spatial domain, so n is basically an index uh, into an image or something like that. And in that case, then this, is e this, is, this makes perfectly good sense. Uh, you look at um, elements uh, to the left of n to determine what elements to the right of n are going to be, and, and so on. So um, I guess we'll go ahead then and determine um, whether or not our system is memoryless, time invariant, linear, causal, and stable. So the first one, memoryless, uh, a system is memoryless if the output at time n, so at a given time, if the output depends only at the on the input at that time. So say when y is or when n is equal to 3, does the input or does the output y of 3 depend only on the input x of 3? Well, you can see y of 3 would be x of negative 3. So the output depends on times that are different. Uh, y of n depends on times different than n. So the answer to this is no, it is not memoryless. Okay, well that was fun, right? That was fairly straightforward. Let's go to the next one, time invariance. And um, basically this is, in my mind, the only way to keep this straight. Uh, your minds probably work better than mine, but I found over the years um, in fact, well, I found over the years that teaching this particular topic brings up deep anxieties because every time I teach it, I tend to screw it up. So this is really the only way I can keep it straight. And the concept is this. If I take a signal x1 and put it into the system, out comes some other signal y1, and then I take that y1 and I delay it for cap n uh, samples. So. I take the signal, run it through the system now, and then wait for a while. Down here, I take the same signal, I wait for a while, I delay it by cap n samples, and then I run it through the system. Okay, so the first output of this is Z1. That's where I took my input, ran it through the system, delayed it. The second output is Z2. I delayed, then ran the delayed signal through the system. And if a system is time invariant, then Z1 and Z2 will be the same. If a system is not time invariant, then they'll be different. Okay. Well, actually, if it's time invariant, Z1 and Z2 will be the same for any X1 that I can put in. So to prove that a system is time invariant, I have to show that no matter what signal I put in, uh, Z1 and Z2 will be true or will be the same. Now, if a system is not time invariant, all I have to do is find one example where I put the same thing in and get different things out, and that proves then that it's not time invariant or that it's time varying. In this particular case, um, 
uh, I have reason to believe, and I'll explain later on why, uh, that this system is not time invariant. And so I'm going to just do an example. So let's suppose that we just take x1 to be the unit step function. Okay, unit step functions are actually good for a lot of these examples because uh, they're easy to understand and quite often they show you where things are where, where things are weird. Okay. So in this case, what we'll do is we'll just take this x1 and run it through the top line and through the bottom line and see if the output is the same in both cases. And if the output is not the same, then I can conclusively say that this system is not time invariant. Okay, so my x1 for both of these guys is going to be a signal that looks like this, right? This is what the unit step function looks like. So at time 0, it goes from being 0 up to being 1. Okay, so this is x1 of t. And now I'll run it through my system to get y1 of t. Okay, so up here we have y1 of n. And you'll remember that the way my system works is when n is equal to 0, my system finds x of negative 0, which in this case is just x of 0, which is 1. Okay, when n is 1, my system goes and finds the input value at negative 1. So x1 of negative 1 is going to be 0. When n is 2, my system goes and finds the value at negative 2. So that's 0. Uh, when, um, uh, when n is negative 1, I go and find the value at negative, negative 1, which is 1, and so on. If you recall, uh, from uh, the video on shifting and flipping, basically we have a system that time reverses or a system that flips a signal. And so that's what it's done here. So it's taken my unit step function and flipped it about the point n is equal to 0. Okay, now I need to delay. And let's suppose for the sake of example that n is equal to 2. So I'm going to take this system and then I'm going to delay it by 2. Okay, so it's going to be... Um, z1 is y1 of n of uh, little n minus 2. So subtracting a positive number is equivalent to shifting to the right. I won't go through that in detail because it is in a previous video. But so when I shift y1 to the right, it ends up looking like this. And I've shifted it to the right, too. So this is z1. Okay, so hopefully, again, you can look at this and conceptually see the path as we go through the top, the top row. Okay, let's do the same thing by going uh, through the bottom row. Okay, so x2 down here is going to be x1 shifted 2 to the right. Again, we'll assume that n is 2. So when I take my unit step function like this and shift it 2 to the right, I have 2, so this would be n is equal to 2, 3, 4, and everything down here is zeros. Okay, so this x2 is now, this signal here is a signal that goes into my system. And again, my system, as we showed up here, takes the input signal and flips it about the value n is equal to 0. So when I do the flipping over here, let's see, we have 0, and then uh, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 3 become 1, 2, and 3. Uh, 1 becomes negative 1, and negative 2, which has a value of 1, or I'm sorry, 2, which has a value of 1, becomes negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and so on. 
So this would be z2 of n. Okay, and you look at this and you say, well, clearly z1 and z2 are not the same. So this system is not time invariant. This is a time varying system. Uh, what happens to your signal depends on what times it goes, what time it goes through the system. So um, again, uh, this one is actually kind of hard to describe conceptually because this whole idea that I take a signal and time reverse it gets a little weird when you start thinking about the details. And so um, this is one where uh, it's you, you can go through the math and you can see that it is time varying. Conceptually what happens is both systems start flipping um, or reversing about the point n is equal to zero at the same time. So if I start reversing x1 at a certain time, then um, I'll get something different than if I wait for a while and then start reversing something. So Conceptually, that's why it is um, not time invariant. Uh, one way that you can tell is often, uh, I haven't seen an example where this is not the case, the fact that I have y of n is equal to x of negative n. This negative n is typically a tip-off that you've got something that is not time invariant. Okay, well, it looks sadly like I've talked too long and we're out of time. So uh, in part two of this video, we'll look at linearity, causality, and stability. So stay tuned for part two. Thanks for watching.